Today, we start our story in England before moving on to Australia. So sit back as we go to the first part of the 19th century. John Natchbull was born in the small village of Mersham in the English county of Kent. He was the son of Sir Edward Natchbull, who was the eighth baronet of Mersham Hatch and his second wife, Frances Graham. The exact year of John's birth is unknown, but it is believed to be 1788, the same year that a British fleet of 11 vessels under the command of Captain Arthur Phillip landed in Australia's Botany Bay. On board were over a thousand settlers and 778 convicts. Shortly after landing, they sailed on to Port Jackson, where a settlement was established at Sydney Cove. John lived with his family in a large house, surrounded by orchards, in a village that was in the heart of the English countryside, five miles outside the small market town of Ashford, and 15 miles from the coastal town of Folkestone. He was, however, quite an unruly child, always wanting to get his own way, so his father sent him to study at Winchester College, regarded as one of the best schools in the country and a hundred miles away from his home. Here he gained a reputation for being stubborn and unyielding. In August 1804, he joined the Navy, serving on many of His Majesty's ships, including the Ardent, Cumberland, Ocean and Ajax. At the time, the Navy was of particular importance because a year earlier in 1803, Britain had declared war on France, a war that lasted for over a decade. By all accounts, John was fearless and very good in battle. In November 1810, he became a lieutenant. However, following the Battle of Waterloo, fought on Sunday the 18th of June 1815, the Navy numbers were reduced and John was retired from service. His retirement pay, however, stopped when it was discovered that his previous behaviour was not that expected of a Royal Navy officer. It was reported that amongst other misdemeanours, he had unpaid debts that had accumulated while serving in the Azores. John was well educated and portrayed himself as a wealthy country gentleman. He spent the next few years gambling and committing petty crimes in London. He associated himself with some very unpleasant characters, none of whom had been fortunate enough to have had the upbringing and education bestowed on himself. They would work together to rob unsuspecting gentlemen, mainly operating at night. By now, John had distanced himself from his family and friends, and they were no longer willing to pay his debts, only for him to resume his life of depravity. Occasionally, they would reach out and try to encourage him to return to a more respectable way of life. Their attempts, however, were always unsuccessful. In August 1824, John was arrested following a robbery committed on an unwitting young gentleman. When questioned by the authorities, he told them that his name was John Fitch and that he was the brother of Sir Edward Natchball. It was not very often that a person from such an aristocratic family ended up sharing the cells with petty criminals. Not surprisingly, the constable in charge suspected that his claim was not true, but agreed to investigate. To his surprise, he discovered that the gentleman was indeed who he said he was. Nevertheless, John's family did not help him. Instead, they told the authorities that justice must be served. On the 19th of August, John Natchball was tried at the Surrey Assizes under the name of John Fitch. He was found guilty and sentenced to transportation to Australia for a period of 14 years. He was then taken to Portsmouth to await his passage and was put on the ship Asia. The departure, however, was delayed for four months due to strong winds. It eventually left port on the 5th of January, 1825, stopping at Santa Cruz on the 24th of January before continuing on to New South Wales, eventually arriving on the 29th of April. Here he was assigned to the Wellington Convict Agricultural Station near the town of Bathurst. This had been founded in 1823 and was where those convicts deemed middle class or educated were sent. Their treatment was better than in most other penal settlements, such as Morton Bay near Brisbane, where prisoners had to contend with the heat and the mosquitoes. And due to this, it was often where some of the worst offenders ended up. 
In 1829, John was granted his ticket of leave. He had apprehended eight runaways, and this had very much pleased the settlement commanders. A ticket of leave was designed to help convicts who were considered capable of being able to support themselves and who had behaved well during their time in the penal settlement. Anyone with a ticket to leave could find employment within a specified district but needed to inform the authorities when anything changed. The prisoner was also granted other rights. They could buy property, marry on request, or bring their families from Britain, but they were not permitted to carry firearms or board a ship. They were also required to attend church. If they observed the conditions of the ticket of leave until the completion of one half of their sentence, they were entitled to a conditional pardon. This removed all restrictions, but they needed to inform the authorities where they would be residing. Those convicts who did not observe the condition of their tickets could be arrested without warrant, tried without recourse, and would forfeit their property. Despite the freedoms John had been granted, he was soon back to his old ways, and on the 31st of December 1831, he was arrested. This time he was charged with forgery. He was tried on the 25th of February 1832 and found guilty. He was then sentenced to death. This sentence was then commuted, and he was given an increase in his original 14-year sentence with the next seven to be served on Norfolk Island. Norfolk Island lies in the Pacific Ocean, 900 miles directly east of Australia. In 1832, it was a penal settlement with the reputation of a place where punishments were harsh and the treatment of the prisoners was severe. It housed many of the worst convicts, which usually meant anyone convicted twice of a crime or those who were sentenced to death but had had their sentence commuted the majority of prisoners on the island, however, were guilty of non-violent crimes, mainly theft, and were serving a sentence of no more than three years. While he was on the ship taking him to the island, John Natchball and his fellow convicts came up with a plan to poison the crew's food with arsenic. The plan would have been a success, but John decided to inform the captain. This was a crime that could be punished by death, but in order for the prisoners to be tried, Captain Lewis would have had to turn the ship around and return to the mainland. So instead, he decided to continue his voyage and let the commandant of the settlement, a gentleman named James Morissette, decide their fate. The prisoners were put in irons and given the hardest duties. Meanwhile, as it was considered that John had prevented a mutiny, he was rewarded with light duties and accommodation in the stables, away from the most troublesome of prisoners. By December 1833, there were nearly 700 convicts on the island, but there were no free settlers. In January 1834, there was an attempted rebellion. However, it was badly planned, and knowing its chances of success were extremely small, John informed the captain, named Captain Fyans, and proceeded to name the mutineers. The soldiers soon rounded them up. The men were tried on the island during July and August. 22 were sentenced to death, and seven had their original sentences increased. The judge, however, commented that Captain Fyans should not have believed that John Natchball was an innocent party in the failed mutiny, and he reprimanded him in court by declaring, Most improperly, sir, did you act as a magistrate in accepting a confession from Natchball? Neither should any deposition have been taken from him. Throughout the trials, his name has been connected in every case. He was the chief of mutineers, the man you should have named first in the calendar. You have saved his life, or prolonged it. He never can do good. Following the failed mutiny, Commandant James Morissette was sent back to Sydney and replaced by Major Joseph Anderson. It was decided that John Natchball should also not stay on the island. It was well known that he had informed on his fellow prisoners, and his safety was something that the soldiers were unable to guarantee. He too was sent back to Sydney. He was placed back in a penal settlement to serve out the remainder of his sentence. On the 8th of July, 1842, he received his ticket of leave. He was given work in Sydney, working on a boat called the Harriet. Unfortunately, the company went bankrupt. John then continued to look for opportunities to obtain more money by way of fraud, forgery or robbery. In late 1843, John became engaged to a young widow 
and Harriet Craig. Their wedding had been arranged for Sunday the 7th of January 1844. Harriet had left her employment and John had put her in lodgings. He, however, had not paid the landlady and had also not paid for the wedding dress, but he agreed to have everything in order the day after the marriage. However, he failed in his attempts to acquire funds and by the 6th of January was very much in need of a means to pay his debts. Mrs. Ellen Jameson was a widow who ran a small store in Margaret Place near Kent Street. John occasionally purchased items there and knew that Mrs. Jameson was in the habit of leaving large amounts of cash in the till. In the evening of Saturday the 6th of January, John walked to the store. He watched it from a distance for some time, which did not escape the notice of people who lived nearby. Eventually, he entered the store and asked Mrs. Jameson for a pint of vinegar. He had planned to rob her till when she was off guard, but quickly realised that he would not be able to steal the money without attacking the defenceless lady. Without another thought, he took out a tomahawk that he had hidden on his person and struck Mrs. Jameson several times. A gentleman named Mr. Shallus, who worked as a builder, had been observing the man acting strangely close to the store and heard a noise that he thought resembled someone breaking a coconut with a hammer. He rushed inside, where he saw Mrs. Jameson lying motionless near a cash till and the man he had been observing lurking by the door. With the assistance of another gentleman named Mr. Jacks, they apprehended him. The night watchman arrived, and they took John Natchbull to the watch station. When searching him, they discovered that his pockets were full of money. A search of the shop the following day found a tomahawk, with many blood spots hidden under a mattress. Mrs. Jameson was not dead. She was looked after by a doctor, and taken to hospital. Twelve days later, on the 18th of January, she died, having never fully regained consciousness. Her two small children were declared orphans. At the inquest, it was concluded that Mrs. Jameson had died as a result of willful murder. The trial began on Wednesday the 24th of January and was presided over by his honour, Mr. Justice Burton. It had received much attention from the Sydney press and public. Mr. Shallus and Mr. Jacks both gave evidence, and the doctor who had attended to Mrs. Jameson, named Dr. Jones, told the court that he believed the tomahawk was the instrument used to inflict the terrible wounds on the deceased. The evidence against the defendant was so overwhelming that the prosecution produced no other witnesses. The defence was conducted by Mr. Robert Lowe, he argued to the court that the murder was only committed because John Natchbull was in fact insane. He claimed that the defendant had yielded an irresistible impulse and could not be held responsible for his crime. A clergyman who had been acquainted with the defendant in 1817 and 1818 told the court that although he had known Mr. Natchbull, he had never formed an opinion as to his state of mind. Insanity had only ever previously been used as a defence on very few occasions, and there was no attempt by the judge to try and ascertain whether or not John Natchbull was or was not insane. Dr Patrick Harnett, who had known the defendant during his time on Norfolk Island, informed the court that he had not had the opportunity to try and establish whether or not the accused was of sound mind. When the trial ended, the jury found the defendant guilty without ever leaving the jury box. His Honour Mr Justice Burton then passed the sentence of death. The sentence was appealed, but upheld, and on the 13th of February 1844, outside Darlinghurst Prison, John Natchbull was hanged in front of an estimated crowd of 10,000 people. He was 56 years old. His lawyer, Mr Robert Lowe, and his wife Georgina, adopted Mrs. Ellen Jameson's two young children, named Bobby and Polly. John Natchbull's brother gave a donation and provided money for the children's education. On the 27th of January 1850, the Lowe's and the two Jameson children returned to England. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case